so my father wouldn't find out. I'd be up in the middle of the night doing laundry uh, so that they wouldn't know that I had an accident in bed during the night. Uh, so I, I wasn't lazy, but I, I lost control. And I think it was linked to the emotional trauma and all of that from the abuse. Um, so I, I became a little bit different from my brothers and the other boys and, and um, uh, my dad was trying to make more of a man-child out of me. He began to not only punish me but shame me and embarrass me in public about my issue which I thought should have been private. Uh, and then at the age of five, Bill, that's when I started taking piano lessons. Well, that didn't go over well in Mississippi either with the little boys in the community because only the girls play the piano where we lived. And so I began to be called sissy and why don't you just play with the girls. And you see what began to happen from a very early age? I was being programmed. And this is what is so dangerous about bullying. If you call a child something long enough, he's going to start believing it. And he's going to have an aversion to the community that's calling him these things. And he's going to wind up in the welcome arms of another community who's happy to accept him. Does that make sense? You know where I'm going with all this? All right. Well, I grew up feeling um, very much out of place with the boys. But I was a spiritual child. Uh, by the time I was, uh, well, I loved going to church, and by the time I was 12 years old, I was actually a church pianist there in our little church in Mississippi, and so that kept me involved in church. I loved church, and I was spiritual, but I still had all this confusion in my head. Why am I different? Why me? What, what's going on? Um, and so when I started school, um, I had uh, my brother, one of my brothers was a year older. Uh, a year stronger, a year bigger, a year better looking, all that. I tell him, you're still a year older. That's <laughs> well, we, every other year in church school, we were in the same classroom. And he, he, could, he could goof off all day long and never open a book and still make straight A's. Well, I wasn't going to be outdone. He's only a year older, so there was a lot of sibling rivalry between us. And so I became an overachiever. And I made sure I was at the top of the class. In, um, in grade school, I graduated as valedictorian. In high school, I graduated as valedictorian. Were we competing? <laughs> I don't know. No. Anyway, Bill and I, you know, we were in the same class, but I was surprised I graduated valedictorian in the, in from high school at the Creek Academy. I was always trying to to um, do well. I, I think I was craving acceptance, belonging, approval, because I wasn't getting it in my family, I mean from my dad especially. He didn't understand that. To give my dad credit, he was 17 when he was married, he was 18 when he became a father, and he fathered six children. He couldn't even finish high school, he was so busy trying to provide for six children and a family and all of that. So he was a child raising children. Things changed a lot over the years, but in those days, I grew up almost, if not literally, hating my father because I felt he was so abusive and he'd embarrass me and tease me and mock me and he was merciless. My mother told me years later that, she said, Ronnie, your dad was the most difficult child I had to raise. <laughs> but they stayed together till death did them part and he very much loved his family and loved my mother um, very, very much. And in those days, I didn't understand any of that because I felt victimized by his misunderstanding. Uh, in my second year of college, I was working my way through college, or trying to, making little dead and nutty bars. <laughs> um, my parents had moved to College Dale, and they could provide me room and board, but that's the best they could do. I had to pay for my education. So I was making as many nutty bars as I could, but I couldn't keep up. So um, in the sophomore year, before the end of the first semester, I was called into the accounting department. And I was told that I needed to come up with $100 to put it on my bill or I couldn't take my exams. That doesn't sound like very much money, but that's a lot of nutty bars. <laughs> 
And um, I couldn't come up with $100. And I panicked. And I remember from that day forward, now I had always done well in school, but from that day forward, I couldn't even pass a daily quiz. All that I could think about was not taking the exams, not being able to pay my bill, and failing. And I'd never really failed at anything in my life of any significance. And it threw me into a tailspin to where I didn't know what to do except to just drop out of school. So I didn't tell my parents. Every morning I'd get up, I'd put on my leather jacket, and jump on my motorcycle, and head off like I was going to college. I don't even know what I did all day long, but I did come home smelling like peanut butter and chocolate. So as far as I knew, everything was fine, because I still went to work. One Sabbath, my dad came into the bedroom and found me still in bed and not getting ready for church. And that surprised him because, like I said, I was spiritual. I enjoyed going to church. I always did. But I, I wasn't getting ready for church that morning, and he started urging me to get out of bed, time to go to church, and I wouldn't. You know, he's English and Dutch and very headstrong, and I'm English and Dutch too, if he is, right? So I was headstrong. Plus, you had the Swedish and Finnish and French and Irish and Cherokee Indian and all that from my mother's side. Anyway, we had this little contest going on, and I would not get out of bed, and they had, they had, no, they had no choice but to go to church without me. And uh, as soon as they departed, I jumped out of bed and I pulled out boxes and suitcases from under the bed that I had already packed, and I loaded them into my car. And Bill, you remember Tim Peckham? Tim Peckham had this car that he was putting, it had been totaled. It was a 55 Pontiac station wagon. And there were no two panels on that car the same color. I mean, it was a prize. And, but the drivetrain was good, it would really run. He sold me that car for $50 and a poodle puppy. That's how I got my first car. Anyway, I loaded that thing up and I was gone. Imagine my parents' devastation when they came home and found my note and realized I had dropped out of school and I was gone. They had no warning and no clue. It took them three days to find out where I was and they were just broken hearted. But it was too late. I couldn't go back to school. Exams had already come and gone. I had missed out. I was just out of school. I was embarrassed because I felt like such a failure. And I just, I, I just didn't know how to face anybody. Well, soon after that, I mean, I got a job working in a, a the Baptist hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. They trained me in as a surgical assistant, which was, I really enjoyed that. I got a, really, a real taste for the medical field doing that. And then I got that letter from Uncle Sam, you all know Uncle Sam, and that invitation that cannot be refused, and I was drafted into the military. If I was not in school, then I had to be in the Army. I went into basic training, medic training, and because of my surgical assistant work, I was able to convince them to let me go to advanced training to be a surgical technician. And so after a year of training, then I was sent overseas for my tour of duty. And I ended up in South Korea, of all places. I had no clue that, I'd be, that we were even still in Korea. All I was thinking about was Vietnam. I didn't want to go to Vietnam. I was thankful to go to South Korea, but it was a real shock and a surprise to me. Uh, I found there was a, a mission compound there in Seoul, Korea, where the GIs, Adventists, could come for the weekend, spend the weekend there uh, away from the base and spend the Sabbath. There were also a lot of student missionaries from Southern California that I thought talked rather funny because they're from California, not from Mississippi or Tennessee. And they were teaching English. And uh, anyway, I got very um, involved in their program. I was playing the piano for Sabbath School and Church on the weekends for them. And when it was time for me to be discharged from the military, I was able to be discharged in Korea and I stayed and joined that team of student missionaries. And it was really a very fulfilling and rewarding work. I loved it. But you know, after being there for a while, and no matter how much you enjoy your work, I think some of you could attest to the fact that it gets tedious sometimes, right? Same with my classes. And I thought, I'm going to do something special with my students. I'm going to teach them to talk Southern drawl. And that was really a lot of fun. But I didn't expect them to take it outside the class. One day I heard them going down the hall. 
hi y'all, they were saying, y'all come back, man, you hear that kind of stuff. It was really funny to hear Koreans talking like that, but um, anyway, at least they were learning some proper English. Uh, <laughs> all those California teachers didn't know what they were doing, right? Um, right after that, the director of the school sent me way south, to south Thailand, of all places. Um, it, it was not related to my southern accent, I don't think, but um, they had a new school in South Thailand and they asked me if I would direct that for another 14 months if I'd be the director of that new school. So I went down to South Thailand and, and taught there for another 14 months. And after being two years overseas, Korea, South Korea and Thailand, I really felt that I knew what I wanted to do with my life because I was still a very spiritual person. And um, this is a shot of me when I was a, a teacher in South Thailand with my little dog Squirt. Um, things have changed over the years. Anyway, um, when it was time for me to come back to, uh, to, to leave that assignment, I decided to go back to college and I was going to train to be a medical missionary. So I went back to Southern, I enrolled in pre-med and theology. And I had the, the GI Bill, so I didn't have that stress, you know, of not being able to pay the bill. I had that, and I worked. I had the surgical tech uh, background. And so I could work, and I had that funding, and I was able to do okay from then on. And then I was back at the top of my game in school again. But through all of this, I still was plagued by the confusion in my head as to who and what I was. Because, and it all started when I was four years old, I know that's where it started. <clears throat> I had same gender attractions, and I hated it. I wanted nothing to do with it. All through school, I had girlfriends like all the other boys did, but you know, Christians don't have to prove themselves, right? If you, you can date, you go out to dinner, you have a good time, you take her home, and that's it. They don't expect anything more from you, really. And so I could pull that off, and I don't think anyone knew the struggle that I was having. And then I came, with, came up with a solution. I like to think I was very intelligent, but I don't think it really worked that time, because I decided if I were to just get married, he would take care of everything. What do you think? How many of you are married, or have been married? Does marriage take care of everything? Or, you know, it can actually be the beginning of woes if you're not married for the right reasons to the right person with the blessing of God and have the right chemistry and all of those things. But I chose to marry one of those Southern California girls that I had worked with in Korea. She was a Christian. She was, a, you know, a happy Christian. So I wanted a Christian home. I wanted a Christian wife. Christian education, we made Christian babies, you know, I made mean, all those choices to do things right. I tried desperately to be in harmony with God's will. And I prayed and prayed that the Lord would take all of this stuff away, the, the gay stuff out of my head. I hadn't acted on any of it. I just, I was confused and I had all that struggle. Well, as I was preparing for graduation, and uh, my son especially laughs at this picture, but you remember those days, don't you, Bill? Uh, college senior. And um, I laugh at what he looked like when he was in college too. But anyway, I was called into the, um, the office of the head of the department, theology department. There were two gentlemen there from the Southern Union, I mean the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, that were inviting me to join their conference in ministry. And uh, it was to the Madison Campus Church, which is a very large church. I had started high school at Madison, and those I thought those people all knew me as a kid. I mean, I was all over the campuses, the mailboy, I worked in the store, I worked in the sanitarium, and all of those different things, and I knew a lot of the people, and I thought, how could I go back to that place where they have all these professional people from the hospital, and the church, and the, the college, and all that, and pastor there, and I kind of panicked because I was kind of a small town person. And I turned down the call, but the big mistake was I didn't pray about it. I didn't pray about it. I just turned down the call because I was dead set on going to medical school. 
I had one more class in physics, and I was going to be off to medical school. And that was my plan. Well, graduation came and went, um, and I didn't go off to medical school. What had happened during the, those last months or so in my theology training, you know, to get into medical school, you have to make straight A's, pretty much. You've got to have a pretty good GPA. And so I started rationalizing. You know, I'm taking theology. We pray before every class, and we're studying the Bible all day long. That's going to count for me. I stopped having my personal, private devotions with the Lord. And even though I was studying theology, I realized now I graduated with a degree in theology with honors, but no relationship with the Lord. And it just snuck up on me, and I didn't realize it. Can you understand how that can happen? And I've met others that have done the same. You can have that degree in theology and have a lot of Bible knowledge and still not have that relationship with the Lord. And I was weak and I was subject to failure. And it was at that point, not long after I graduated, that I finally gave in to this confusion that had been plaguing me all of my life. Um, I was mortified with, with what I had done. But I, um, I was honest with my wife and I told her. And she, being the Christian that she was, she um, said, you know, we can work through this. Why don't we go to counseling? She was forgiving and she was willing to stick it out. You have to give her a lot of credit. She was not willing to let go. I agreed to go to counseling with her and we did some counseling together. I felt once I had fallen into that sin that I was unchangeable. I mean, from the very first experience, I felt totally addicted. And I just say, I really believe this is a, an addiction. But it's a sin addiction. The bondage of sin. We read about the bondage of sin. And though I was mortified with, with what I had done, I knew I'd be back. I, I was out of control from that first experience. I felt totally unchangeable. As we were counseling with pastors and counselors from our own denomination. I know they don't all have this view, but at that point, the ones we went to, the ones I remember, would then talk to my wife and say, you know, Mrs. Woolsey, you need to just divorce this man and get on with your life. That kind can never change. Wow. And that was from Adventists. So I didn't trust Adventist pastors and counselors. Now, I, of course, I've met many that don't believe that, but those particular ones did, and it, it made me angry, and it hurt me, and made me bitter. That kind can never change, and I started thinking, what do you mean that kind can never change? Is God impotent or omnipotent, right? If I can't be changed by God, then He must not be omnipotent. And if He can change me but chooses not to, then He's not a God of love. See my faulty reasoning? And so I turned on God. And when we went through that devastating divorce, and I went headlong into the world, angry, bitter, resentful against God himself, and the church, and pastors. <laughs> I didn't want to have anything to do with any of them. I, not only what did I, was I unchangeable, I became unreachable. I wouldn't read anything, watch anything, listen to anything, go anywhere, or talk to anyone that had anything to do with religion. I was done. A degree in theology and done with God. That's sad. But the thing of it is, I didn't understand the plan of salvation. And I had a degree in theology. I know you may think that doesn't make sense, but trust me, I know a lot of other people with the same situation. Shortly after that, not only was my wife devastated, and I, we went through the divorce, and she and the children moved out to California, my father was also devastated. Um, he felt, when, when this all came out, he felt responsible, he felt guilty, he, he was, I saw him just weeping and begging me to forgive and all kinds of things for what he had done and, and it was too late, I mean I was done. Uh, he, not long after that, had a massive heart attack and almost died, he was only 55 years old. The doctors gave him five years to live if he would have multiple bypass surgery. Dad, who had never even finished high school, um, asked the question, 
I think about Loretta Lynn, how once she said, I may be ignorant, but I ain't stupid. Right? There's a difference, right? Ignorant means you're uneducated. Stupid means you can't be educated. <laughs> I guess, something like that. Well, Dad was, was kind of that way, I think. And he asked the surgeon, what if I don't have the surgery? And the surgeon said, well, Mr. Woolsey, now, if you don't have the surgery, you probably won't live more than five more years. Okay. So what do you think Dad did? Yes, sir. Checked himself out, went home. He could die on the operating table. You know, why go through all of that? It's five years either way, why go through that? So he and my mother checked into Uchi Pines in Alabama and decided they were going to give God's way a chance to see if God could do better than five years. And so we'll leave it right there for now in the story. Uh, but my parents um, now had a prodigal son who was unchangeable and unreachable. I don't know whether you know anyone like that. Do you, do you know anyone that seems to be unreachable and unchangeable? What do you do? Uh, there are a lot of things you cannot do, but there are some things you can do. So I want to tell you how my parents began to work for their prodigal son. I ended up moving out to Southern California to live my gay life there. Uh, actually, I started in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, three years in Fort Lauderdale, <clears throat> then moved out to Southern California. The little boy in the red shirt is my older son uh, through that marriage. That was his eighth grade graduation or something there. Um, but I lived my gay life primarily out there. My parents um, became prayer warriors. And uh, here's a, a picture of some of my family, my parents, my sister. Do you recognize Melody there? My sister, and my little grandmother, my brother and his wife. And uh, anyway, my family began praying for me without ceasing. They loved me unconditionally. My father went through some major changes throughout his experience. And they never could really afford to travel very much, but somehow they found a way to get from Mississippi out to California almost every year to spend time with me in my home and with my friends. They did not condone our behavior, but they never made us feel condemned. We felt loved. We didn't feel like they were compromising anything. They never compromised anything. They showed compassion without compromise. And we loved our parents. My friends just loved my parents and they genuinely loved my friends. Um, and then of course I said they were praying without ceasing. I didn't know all of that. But then the third thing is they became forgetful. Well how does that work? Every time they left my home to come back to the south they left something behind. And I would find it maybe under my pillow in my bed, like this big, beautiful study Bible. And um, anyway, it had a nice letter in it, so they were forgetful. They left it anyway. I just picked it up, put it in the bookcase. I wasn't interested in the Bible, but I didn't have the heart to throw it away. I mean, it was a love, token of love for my parents. On another trip, there was a, a nine-volume set. <laughs> they somehow forgot and left behind. On yet another trip, there was a five-volume set. <laughs> Never said a word about it. They just drove off and somehow left them behind. Then there was a book called The Story of Redemption. On another occasion, the little book Steps to Christ. I knew what they were doing, but anyway, I called... I call that my left behind series. And I put that in my bookcase to collect dust. I wasn't interested in any of it, but I, for some reason, I didn't have the heart to throw any of it away. So you see what the Lord was doing through my parents? He knew I was unreachable, humanly speaking. So through my parents, the Word of God was being planted in my house. And then it came time for the Lord to work. And I just, I look back and I think, you know, the Lord is very clever. He knows what He's doing. He knows how to cast the, what do you call it, the, cast the hook. He knows when to reel you in, right? And so, this one night, after years of collecting these books, those are just a few that I remember. After years of collecting these books, one night I had a terrible nightmare in which 
uh, my life, not from beginning to that, that time, but my present life passed before me. Just about everything I was involved with in my life was in that dream. I was, please don't laugh, I was a dancer and a dance instructor, and I was in nightclubs all the time. Um, I did a lot of inline skating, I did a lot of partying, I was a hang glider pilot, loved going hang gliding. Um, and all of these things were in that dream, and it was so realistic, I had no idea I was dreaming. It was just one activity from another. Uh, I did a lot of bicycling as well. And, uh, oh yeah, I did work. <laughs> that was also in there. But you can see, my life was so full of activity, there was no time for God. I was drowning out the, the voice of God in my head. But it, as that dream progressed, it was kind of dark and gloomy, which is, I think, quite appropriate but extremely realistic, and suddenly the, the scene lit up, and I looked up, and Jesus was coming in the clouds of glory, and this picture probably does not show up very well on your screen. Anyway, it's a beautiful picture if you ever see it. But Jesus was coming in the clouds of glory, and I was one of the lost. Can you imagine my terror? The Bible describes it, where the wicked call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from his face. That was me. I was absolutely terrified. I was not rejoicing at the coming of Jesus. I wasn't saying, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. No, I was terrified. I woke up in the middle of the night in what I call beautiful darkness because I felt safe in the darkness, not facing Jesus. And I remember saying, thank God that was just a dream. I actually thanked God for something. <laughs> thank God that was just a dream. <clears throat> I struggled to go back to sleep. The next day I got up, went about life, and forgot all about it until I had the same dream again. Sometime later I had the same dream again. And then it became a recurring nightmare for about three years. Not every night or week or every month, but when I would least expect it, I'd have that same dream again. And uh, uh, living to see Jesus come, but as a lost person. Um, do you think the Lord was trying to reach me? Mm -hmm. I think he was reaching out himself because I was unreachable, humanly speaking. After about three years of this, I remember one day coming to my senses to a point, I remember saying, you know, I can keep on blaming God for everything wrong in my life until Jesus does come to the clouds of glory, I'm still lost. I realized that blaming was solving nothing. Blame is self-justification. If I can blame someone else for the reason I'm doing what I'm doing, then I'm justified. But you know, God cannot justify you when you're justifying yourself. Mm. Think about that. And I stopped blaming, and I started questioning. Why am I this way? It doesn't make sense. Everything you hear today that the gay community says, every gay excuse, I could have invented them. I mean, they're nothing new. God made me this way, God loves me this way, or only I didn't feel loved by God, but I did think once gay, always gay, this is an acceptable alternative lifestyle, and all of those things. But I stopped blaming God, and when you stop blaming God, when I stopped blaming God, my conscience started working again. Praise the Lord. And I started feeling conviction, and I started thinking, I need to find answers. It doesn't make sense that I was born this way because my parents weren't gay, where would I get it? And their parents weren't gay and their parents weren't gay. And every gay person that has ever been born has a father and a mother somewhere. It comes through heterosexuality. Gay people don't procreate together. So, and now we know scientifically there is no such thing as a gay gene, it is not genetic. That's a political hoax that has been put upon the world and the church. And I can tell you all about that. It's in my second book, where that all came from, to get minority status. You have to be born that way to get legal minority status. So that's where that comes from. And it didn't make sense. I was just reasoning this out. And then I started thinking, well, surely there has to be answers. And I started connecting the dots in my life, just reasoning. You know, God says, come now, let us reason together. So I decided, well, I'm going to start reasoning with God and see if he can give me the answers. Where do you think I went to find answers? 
my Left Behind series, that's right. <laughs> I, again, I wouldn't go to pastors, counselors. I didn't want to hear one more time that kind did never change. So, I pulled out that big, beautiful Bible and I opened it. I took a look at it and I closed it and put it back. I could not read that Bible. My mind was basically mushed from being a TV addict all those years. Hadn't read anything of any substance. So I put it back and then I noticed there was a little bitty book in that collection. Maybe I could read the little book. You know which one? Yeah, uh, short chapters and big letters and easy reading and Steps to Christ. So I pulled out Steps to Christ and I opened it and 